Oh, that was like. Man, real. So we took his like canvas link, right? And we wrote like a calendar canvas link that he can go use. Yeah, we did that. And he's like, what do you paste it in there? So you paste that calendar. And you are. Is that date? Yeah. What? Yeah. Where, wait, 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 where was that? Yeah, yeah. honest. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You call it stupid, but you got So, where is it? Uh, we all good? Nice. All right. Yeah. Chilling. Hanging out. Um, we've been walking through sort of what we call the perfect competition model uh, that uses clusters to describe the output of uh, representative firm, the decision made by the representative firm, to the quantity that it desires to produce. We did that with geometry. Today, we do it with algebra. And a little bit of calculus. So, we start with the description of the profit that the firm captures. We say the profits are a function of total revenue minus total costs. I'm going to describe costs as a function of quantity. Well, then where are profits maximized? Profits are maximized at, uh, at the first derivative of this function with respect to quantity. So I'll take the first derivative of this. Respect quantity, the first order of the p times q with respect to q is just p. Q falls out minus some function of quantity, uh, function of cost determined the quantity uh, taken in the first derivative as well. And when our profits are being maximized, this expression will be equal to zero. Now, are we sure about that? Do we understand that? This is like, you know, what you will be familiar with is uh, a parabola that looks like this. And we're trying to find is the maximum point on that parabola. However, in this case, we have two, two, uh, two terms in our equation. Um, so what we're really trying to find is, in a way, the, the maximum point between these two functions. So we have a difference between here and here. We're trying to find the gap that is the biggest. Down here, the gap will be smaller. Down here, the gap will be smaller. Here, the gap is as big as it can get, the gap being profits. This function is a good description of total revenues. Do you believe me? Okay. Let's go back a step and think about our demand curve and remind ourselves that, demand, that total revenue is equal to price times quantity. And that's what we have on our demand curve is price and quantity. And so when Quantity is very low and price is very high as a function of quantity. Total revenue is also very low. But then as our quantity increases and price falls, it turns out our total revenue increases. And it continues to go up, but then at some point, total revenue is low again. So we get a function that looks like this. 
This is our total revenue function. Now you can plug this into uh, into you plug some numbers in and prove this to yourself. You can also say, okay, well, total revenue is equal to price times quantity. Uh, let's see if I ever want to get the expression of this. Um, demand is usually given as an expression of uh, of let's see. Um, we, uh, the demand curve is given as an expression of quantity as a function of price. Or it could be now just the price is equal to n minus q. So then total revenue would be equal to price times n minus price, or let's do it in terms of quantity. Total revenue is equal to quantity times 10 minus quantity. And if we multiply this through, we get total revenue is equal to a 10 Q minus Q squared. Now you remember that negative Q squared is an inverted parabola. Yeah, okay, hopefully I've persuaded you to some degree that this is what we're actually doing. Okay. Then given the expression that profit is maximized when profit, the first derivative of profit with respect to quantity is P minus C prime Q. And that is when we reach the maximum of this curve. What we're saying there is that at that point, the slope of this curve is zero. The slope of that curve is zero. So we're maximizing at that point when the slope is zero. Anywhere else along this curve, of course, the slope will not be zero. They're all along the, in the advance of this. The marginal revenue, which is what we're measuring when we measure the slope along the curve, we're mar measuring the margin. The marginal revenue is increasing all the way throughout here. And here, the marginal revenue is decreasing. So as we move along the Q axis, as we move towards the right, total revenue is increasing until we hit some point at which after, as we continue to increase quantities, total revenue is decreasing, or the marginal revenue is decreasing. Okay. Okay. That is, any movement along the quantity variable will decrease our total revenue. Okay, so where the slope is zero, that is where it is maximized. Notice that this is also the unit elastic point in our demand curve. And that marginal revenue is, revenue is greater than zero in the elastic portion of our demand curve. And that marginal revenue is negative in the inelastic portion of our demand curve. Okay. I may have lost some of you, but I'm going to keep going because I'm going to have one. That'd be great. Okay, well, if this is true, then profit is maximized when I can rearrange this. I can say, well, price minus the first derivative of cost with respect to quantity equals zero, then price is equal to this function. And remember that for the representative firm, what is price? For the representative firm, it is reading price off of the market. And for that firm, their demand curve is equal to, marginal revenue curve is equal to the price. So marginal revenue equals price. For the representative firm. And this is an expression of marginal cost. So then what I've basically just proven is that profit is maximized where marginal revenue is equal to marginal cost. It should be familiar to you. Right. Professor Harwitz of 
got married a couple of years ago before he, before he passed away. He had just gotten married recently. And inside of his wedding ring and his wife's wedding ring, they, uh, they have an engraving. And, and each of them inside of their wedding ring said marginal benefit is greater than marginal cost, which means that getting married was worth it at the margin. And that's how economists say. And people who love economists understand this. It's flattery. For, okay, so then marginal cost, marginal cost, must also be where, where, where the firm is maximizing profits, the marginal cost must also be upward sloping. So the marginal cost curve starts out decreasing if the price were particularly low. It would be possible for the firm to produce a marginal revenue equals marginal cost, but along the downward sloping portion of the marginal cost curve. The firm would not want to do that. <clears throat> The firm is always going to want to produce where the marginal cost curve is up or sloping. And you can prove that algebraically by taking the second derivative. I will not do that. Okay. <clears throat> Having a flat demand curve such as this basically means that the firm can produce as many units as it wants to, and it can sell as many units as it wants to, and it won't affect prices. So then the firm is going to choose where to produce based upon where it can maximize its profits. That's the only decision the firm makes. How to change its mix of inputs so as to capture the maximum out of profits. Now, we've also talked about the differences amongst costs. So the total cost curve is a composite of fixed costs and variable costs. We know that average total costs then is equal to total costs divided by quantity. We defined this already. And so then in order to find uh, average total cost from this expression, we would divide everything in this expression by quantity. So average total cost is equal to the fixed costs divided by quantity plus the variable costs divided by quantity. And here we find our expression of average total costs. Now, this expression is average fixed costs. And this expression would be average variable costs. Average fixed costs we know are constantly declining as quantity increases. We can see that because as the denominator of this term gets larger, the whole term gets smaller. So it's the case when the denominator gets larger, the term gets smaller. Similarly, average variable costs would seem to be getting smaller constantly, but it depends upon what's inside of this function. Knowing this, we can start with this expression. We can remind ourselves that profits are equal to price times quantity minus costs as some function of quantity. This is total costs. And we can remind ourselves that total costs divided by quantity is average total costs. So then total costs is equal to average total costs divided by quantity.
flip that around. Make sure I'm doing this right. Nope. If the average total cost is times quantity, thank you. And then multiply both sides by quantity. Okay. So then profit is equal to price times quantity minus average total costs times quantity. And notice what I've just found. What I've just done is I've said that profit is equal to The point at which you choose quantity, whatever quantity you choose, profit is equal to price times quantity, price times quantity, that would be this entire rectangle, minus average total cost times quantity, here's your average total cost times quantity at that point here, the quantity. In this region is your profits. Price times quantity, average total cost times quantity. This area minus this area, the remainder is profits. It's helpful to formalize all this stuff because we can then later on use these formal models to create uh, to create. Uh, empirical models that can be tested using data. You can, you can plug in data for these things and, get, and run regressions. You have to have the model first in order to be able to do it. And again, what quantity is chosen? The profit maximizing quantity where marginal revenue equals marginal cost as proven in the previous example. Um, you might want to know whether it's true that marginal cost intersects with average total cost at the bottom of the average total cost curve. You can do that by reminding yourselves, okay, average total cost is equal to this function of cost divided by quantity, total cost divided by quantity. But then we can remind ourselves, well, what's a good expression for, for this? And it's this. I'll plug that in for C of Q. And the average total cost is equal to the fixed costs plus the variable cost function divided by quantity. And then my question is, well, where is average total cost at its minimum? And in order to find the minimum, you do the same thing as you do to find the maximum. You take the first derivative. Okay. Well, what's the first derivative of all of this? With respect to quantity, this requires the use of the chain rule and of uh, the difference rule in calculus. I'm not going to drag you through that stuff right now, but what I will do is I'll just give you the answer, which is equal to one over Q times the first derivative of the variable cost curve minus the fixed costs plus the variable costs function all divided by Q. Now, in order to find the minimum, we find where this is equal to zero, the one over Q drops out. And we find that we get this expression. And what is this expression saying? Well, this is marginal costs. 
first derivative of our cost of our variable cost curve is our marginal cost curve. Okay. And this is our average total cost curve. So the the average total cost curve is at its minimum when it is equal to the marginal cost curve. We've been finding the minimum here. And so here's our average total cost curve again. And when is that at its bottom? When it is equal to the marginal cost curve, which is what we've been drawing. The average total cost curve is bottom where it intersects with the marginal cost curve. And there's the intuition behind that is that as marginal cost is below average total cost, it's pulling the average total cost curve down. The marginal cost is above average total cost curve, it's pulling the average total cost curve up. But now we've formalized it. And again, having these formal equations can be useful later on when we get to empirical questions or when we complicate things. We will a little bit. We will complicate this a little bit as we go forward. Any questions about any of the math, the math there? I briefly started talking about how we can talk about the spectrum of different kinds of firms between perfect competition and perfect monopoly. A pure monopoly exists and there's only one firm in the market. And so this is if there are no direct competitors. That gets complicated because, well, what are we talking about? We're talking about the market. Get to that. Um, a monopoly is neither good nor bad in a normative sense. We're not going to try to apply normative measures as much as we can. It's just another market structure. So the first commandment of the Ten Commandments is an example of a monopoly. Thou shalt have no other gods before me, says the Lord. So God is claiming a monopoly. Should we be at all surprised? <coughs> The second commandment is a barrier to entry. Thou shalt have, uh, thou shalt create no uh, great images or idols. So then that is a barrier to entry, making it more difficult for there to be other gods, helping God to maintain his monopoly. So there are no substitutes. For there to be a good, for there to be a true monopoly, right? There has to be competition or substitutes. Now, this is also similar to uh, the marriage document. What is the first thing that a marriage document does? It establishes a monopoly. Each person has a monopoly on the other person. My wife has a monopoly in, on me. Sorry, ladies. But that's it. It establishes a barrier to entry. It disallows substitutes. So a monopoly might be a good thing sometimes. It's not always a bad thing. However, a monopolist cannot charge whatever price it wants to, as some people will claim. Well, monopolies are bad. They can charge whatever price they want to. The price of meat is going up. It's because the firms are just capturing more profit. Can't always be true. A monopolist always faces two different kinds of competition. First, the monopolist has to compete for the general consumer dollar. Even Facebook, if a monopolist, has to face a demand curve at some point. What is the demand curve really saying? The demand curve is saying that in order to buy this quantity of this good, it's going to cost you this price. Okay. What does that price a stand in for? What does that price represent? 
is the opportunity cost of buying anything else. Right? When you buy this many of this, it's going to cost you this much. That price is saying, I'd rather buy this than anything else. It's costing you the opportunity to buy other things that you could buy with that money. In a way, price is actually well described as all other goods. Your access to having anything else. I'm buying this instead of something else. Now, now do you have to pay for Facebook? Well, let me ask you this. If, if you wanted to go to a museum, right, and usually the museum costs $30 to visit the museum, but they have one day a year that it's open for free. So you're like, I'm going to go on the free day. And you get to the museum, and what do you observe? What? A long line. A long line to get into the museum. Huh. Now you get to the long line at the museum, and you have to make a decision. Do I want to go into the museum or not? Right? And if you decide that I am going to go into the museum, then it must be the case that the amount of time that it's going to take before you can get into the museum, multiplied by the opportunity cost of your time, is less than $30. You see, you pay with time, don't you? Time is money, many people say. Or at least it's an opportunity to be earning money. All of you are thinking, my God, I could be making money right now instead of sitting in Snow's class. If there's an opportunity cost for being here. The marginal cost for attending my class is zero. You can just walk in. But the opportunity cost is whatever else you could be doing with this time. That could be very high. I appreciate you. So Facebook doesn't charge a price, but it does swallow up a lot of people's time. Okay, so maybe we're not talking about Facebook. Maybe we're talking about TikTok. I don't know. Whatever it is you guys are looking at these days. Right? It's using up your time. Okay. So, so any monopoly has to compete for the, the general dollar, the general struggle for the consumer dollar. For example, even in uh, in Muncie, where uh, where Indiana Michigan Electric Power Company exists, right? Even though they have a monopoly in the provision of electricity, right, they still have to compete. With Meyer for my money. At some point, I will turn the thermostat down so that I can buy more ramen noodles because I'm poor. I'm not. I haven't had ramen noodles in today, but I do like them sometimes. Second, a monopolist has to compete with the presence of close substitutes. For example, uh, Indiana Electric Power has to compete in the market for provision of light. With the sun. In the summer, I would probably use my electric lights less. It also has to compete with candles and lanterns and fireplaces. In the market for heat, the power company competes with center point gas, with propane services, with warm quilts and sweaters. And my wife, giving each other warm. The presence of substitutes then moderates the pricing of the monopolist. The monopolist can maintain its position only if it is not fully exploited. If the monopolist tries to fully exploit its position, I will switch. I will switch to something else. The supplier of gasoline close to where a hurricane has hit might be accused of price gouging, but there are always substitutes. Of course, there's always the universal substitute. What's the universal substitute? Anybody? Universal substitute? Yeah. For like driving or like movement, like just walking. Oh, my God. The universal substitute is that you don't buy anything, in which case you just get dead. In economics, you can always get dead. It's always an option. It might not be something that you prefer, but that's preferences. They use the list non SB Bless you. Did you say bless you? Yeah. Good. Yes. That means there's no accounting for tastes. Talk my term again and I'll make you read the article. Oh, I'll make you read the article anyway. Good article, I stay going back. All right. On what foundations might a monopolist emerge? 
when might we expect to observe a monopolist existing? Well, we might observe a monopolist if there if the monopolist has an endowment of natural resources. Or De Beers, right? If De Beers owns all of the diamond mines in the world, then they can charge a higher price for diamonds. At a certain point, though, if they charge too high of a price for their diamonds, people will substitute to buying rubies and emeralds. They'll also encourage, if they charge too high of a price, they'll encourage entrepreneurs to explore for new diamond mines. Indeed, the beers must expend a good amount of monopoly profits it's, or it, that it earns looking for potential new sources of diamonds. And it has to purchase those sources itself to prevent competition from entering. The rents or extra profits that the beers captures might all be spent on maintaining its position. And when it buys those resources up, in order to maintain its position, those resources go to other people. And so there is no capture of rents at all. The extra profits have to be spent some way, somehow, anyhow, or pass along to shareholders to spend. So the real problem with monopoly is not the profits that the monopolist earns. You should not be upset with the monopolist when it earns profits. The real problem with the monopolist isn't the profits that it earns, but instead the dead weight losses that emerge as a consequence of it being a monopolist. We'll get to that in a minute. Another way that a monopolist can maintain its position is by ownership of patent laws. Now, notice what I just did about this argument for there being a monopoly. What we're always trying to aim for is the policy conclusions, okay? Because, because really antitrust and industrial organization is nothing but glorified price theory. It's the same exact thing as price theory. The main distinction is that we're applying it to the strategic behavior of firms in marketplaces and these policies that exist. So when the rules change, it is the responsibility of the economist to demonstrate what the relevant opportunity costs are for that new set of rules relative to some alternative set of rules. So many times a potential competitor or an antitrust regulation agency will try to identify a firm as behaving monopolistically. And if they try to argue that this firm is behaving monopolistically, and part of the reason we can prove it is that they have this endowment of natural resources, that might work out to be a bad argument. Because that endowment of natural resources <coughs> does not capture all the other opportunities that people can spend their money. It also doesn't capture the fact that in order to maintain that position, they have to expend resources that dissipate any rates that they would be capturing. So it's not, it's not evidence. It's not sufficient evidence. Make a case against a firm that they are monopolists simply by saying they have an endowment of natural resources. Secondly, we have patent laws. Now, patent laws make it possible for a person to have an exclusive right to create a commodity with certain specified attributes over a specified period of time. For example, DuPont once held a patent on cellophane, which is basically saran wrap. The Minnesota Mining Company, 3M, once held a patent on scotch tape. They're the only company that can make scotch tape. A patent confers a private property right so that innovators have a greater incentive to produce or invent new things. However, it's important that you recognize that the development of a patent or the awarding of a patent is something that is done artificially by the rest of society for that firm. We've already agreed that this person can have a patent. That's how they happen to get one. If a firm does not have a patent, but it does have some sort of exclusive product, they might be able to continue to capture profits in the long run. The question is whether or not 
their production process is imitable, whether it can be copied by somebody else. Another reason that a firm might be have might have monopoly position is if the cost, if the fixed costs in particular of establishing efficient scope or scale are very high relative to market size. Okay, so we've drawn a long run average total cost curve. And if fixed costs are a very large share of the total costs in the production of a good or a service, then we'll have an average total cost curve that is constantly decreasing. In that case, this cost function will encounter the market demand curve at some point. If the fixed costs are very high and there currently exists one firm in the market, then it will be the efficient producer of that good or service. It will be a monopolist in that market. In order for another firm to enter, what would happen is that both firms would be competing for the total market demand. As a result, each firm would be producing a smaller quantity. So Q1 would produce this amount and, and firm two would also produce this amount. Right? But in doing so, their costs of production would increase. Having then an efficient scale of enterprise or scope for that matter is one method that a firm might be a monopolist. This particular structure we call a natural monopoly. It's a naturally occurring monopoly. Typically to get to the efficient size play it requires that you have a lot of fixed capital. When output is zero you still have to pay that high fixed cost but average costs are diminishing over a large range. For example both of my grandfathers helped to lay underwater telephone cables during the, uh, across the Atlantic Ocean during World War II. They're both involved in laying these cables underwater. It was very expensive, but very useful to the war effort. I only discovered this within the last year, but you can't send an electric signal through one wire all the way across the ocean back in the day. So how did they get the signal across the ocean? Or some, yeah, what's the word? Did they use submarines? They didn't use submarines, but they did use boats. So they would send the wire under the water as far as it could go while maintaining the signal. Then the wire would come back up to a boat. And then that boat would um, amplify the signal and send it back through the wire again up to another boat. So for a very long time, there were this string of boats right across the ocean attached to these wires, but the boats couldn't move or they couldn't leave anyway. They had some, some leeway, but they couldn't leave. So then you had to provision those boats out in the middle of the ocean. Okay. As the signal gets stronger, you need fewer boats. The entire structure of that, of that process is, is kind of fascinating to me. More recently, fiber optic cables have been laid across most of the Earth's oceans and to many of our own neighborhoods. Now, when they laid the fiber optic cables, they were able to put repeaters attached to, to power sources on the bottom of the ocean. And so they don't need to go up to a boat and then back down again. Really speeds up the signal that gets sent, and you don't have to pay for boats. The increase in capacity of fiber optics has increased at a rate similar to that of Moore's Law. Very, very, very fast. You build these fiber optic cables and you send light through them, and that light is the signal. Well, what they didn't know in the 90s and late 90s and early 2000s when they were laying all these fiber optic cables everywhere in the world was that you could use different colors. You could use different wavelengths of light 
and send multiple different beams of light through the same wire, through the same glass thread at the same time. So that the, the need for many, many, many fiber optic cables was much less than they expected. They were able to send a lot more signal through the same space. As a result, the amount of fiber optic cable that had been laid was more than was needed, greatly more than was needed. And so a lot of long distance telephone companies found that the demand for their product was very, very low. And they went out of business, right? That was part of the whole dot-com bust in the early 2000s. Pretty interesting stuff, right? To lay a cable, it costs a billion dollars, but only completes 10 phone calls at a time is a very high fixed cost. But if that same $1 billion cable eventually completes over 5 billion calls, well, that's an average cost of 20 cents per call. We are now paying less than that per call, right? How much does it cost to call Mexico? Nothing. I can do a video call with my daughter in China when she's there for free because there's so much bandwidth. We do all that from our mobile phones, wherever in town we want to be, the signal. Now, sometimes these types of monopolies with a very high fixed cost of production are called natural monopolies. And these become monopolies because of natural forces. Is the post office a natural monopoly? There's only one US Postal Service, right? Is it a natural monopoly? How many say yes, it's a natural monopoly? How many say no? What evidence can you give that it is not a natural monopoly? Yeah. I don't, are private carriers allowed to carry mail? Well, there is competition. That's one evidence, piece of evidence, yes. The, especially with Amazon, FedEx, and UPS, they can send packages even at a cheaper rate okay. than the post office can and not be limited by government regulation. Okay. But the, the, the most powerful evidence that the Postal Service is not a natural monopoly is that it was protected by the government from competition. In other words, if, if it were a natural monopoly, it would not need protection. The fact that there is protection indicates that it is not a natural monopoly. You follow? All right. Why would you need a law to enforce what nature achieves on its own? Is the government a natural monopoly? Oh, it's harder. What about space travel? I wrote these notes back in the day before Elon Musk had ever sent anything into space. Is that a natural monopoly? What about concrete production? What about the production of concrete? Is that a natural monopoly? Actually, it depends on the scope of the market. With any small, within any small re region, right, production of concrete might be a reasonable natural monopoly. However, across the entire nation, there's many, many small concrete companies. What about electrician's services or hair braiding services? All of these are justifications for a, uh, a monopoly, or each of them observed, is observed to be monopolistic in some way or another. We always want to test it to ask, okay, but is it a natural monopoly? All right, we'll move on from here next time. Uh, I think we're out of time. Thank you. Yeah. Has it been canceled for tomorrow? One has moved to online for me. Yeah, so so our preemptive need to cancel for us. I got eight. I almost, I almost canceled. Oh, no, we wanted to see you. Was it because I was feeling like that crap? <laughs> uh, you're out today. He's still planning to show up. In the show?